it's uh, pretty amazing to be here and think back of when I went to my first conference, which I think was the 81 conference, and, and uh, it's been quite a ride. Um, just to share an anecdote with you uh, from that 81 conference, I had just hired on to Hewlett Packard and I worked in, in what was the user's library back then as an applications engineering group. And there was a, a certain amount of frenetic activity within HP to try to keep a couple of projects secret because they hadn't been introduced yet. And we knew that Richard was very inquisitive. Uh, and uh, um, my, my favorite uh, anecdote from that effort of secrecy was that uh, we had a uh, what would become the HP 75, the first uh, basic uh, language machine. Um, it had a nickname Kangaroo. And so somebody came up with the idea of renaming the robot in the card recording department uh, Kangaroo. And so we made a Kangaroo sign and hung it on the robot in hopes of distracting um, Mr. Nelson here. Uh, uh, but. That was, a, that was an amazing time at, at Hewlett Packard. Um, I, uh, um, and uh, I certainly enjoyed my, my time working with some seriously clever people. Do you remember uh, the picnic? I don't think I was at the picnic. Oh, okay. um, so um, I'm going to pick up uh, with uh, uh, Jeremy's Chesset project. Uh, first, and just give you a couple of thoughts about how that was put together. Um, regrettably, I forgot my third arm this morning, um, so the ambidextrous thing isn't doing too well. Uh, but what I want to do is hand around uh, the king and the queen uh, pair, and you guys, you guys can experiment um, seeing how they fit, to, seeing how they fit together. Um, and, and now, Dave, you have to give it back. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> um, so, Jeremy uh, first broached this idea to me. Uh, you can go to the first slide. Um, first, next slide? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I, I guess I should start by saying what I'm going to talk about. Um, we have a, a, a clicking challenge up here with the slide. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the chess set, and uh, then um, for th those of you who are conversant with Thingiverse, there's a project on there called the Harmonic Transformer, and I've rendered an aluminum version of that and brought it here to show you. Um, and then uh, another device, uh, the Cometarium, uh, is, a, is a mechanical illustration of Kepler's second law, so I'll share that with you. And uh, then uh, a very recent project uh, are the Janelle Lucas calculating rulers. And all. the first prototype um, was finished hours before I uh, jumped in the car to drive down here. And uh, so I'll, I'll share that with you as well. Um, Jeremy first broached the, the chess set project quite a number of years ago. And, and um, the, the king and the queen uh, pair uh, are terrifying if you have to manufacture them. And the reason is that the king piece has a very, very tight inside cut. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so here's the, here's the whole set. Um, this folds up, and, and you'll, you'll see that on the, on the table over here. There's the cube. This is the box that the cube folds into. So the chest set collapses to a cube. The cube collapses into the, uh, the playing board, and then the playing board goes into a, a box uh, with a chest set, recursive chest set on the, on the top of it. Um, the, the problem with, with making this thing is that the, uh, the king has a very tight interior angle to it. And uh, it's just a few thousandths of an inch. And so your average milling cutter doesn't do very well in those geometries. And it took 
quite a long time to figure out the best way to do that. And it turned out at the end of the day that simplicity uh, was the better choice. Um, if you imagine making a custom milling cutter to cut the, that big slot that is the king, um, that's about a $1,600 cutting tool, uh, which would be utterly terrifying to use because it's almost eight inches in diameter um, on a three-quarter inch piece of aluminum. You know, what could possibly go wrong? Um, and uh, uh, um, at the end of the day, the company I was working with in Washington to make the custom cutter basically said, how many of these pieces do you want? <laughs> well, not very many to start. And they said, well, we'll cut them for you using our wire ADM machine. So for those of you not familiar with wire ADM, uh, what that's all about, I think we can go to the next slide, Richard. Um, this, is the, uh, this is the interior angle I'm talking about. So imagine trying, imagine trying to cut that. And then here's the picture of them uh, folded together. Um, EDM machining is uh, a, an industrialized version of the what happens when you connect the jumper cables to your battery of your car. You get a little spark, and you you know you get a pit. Well, if you weaponize that into an industrial process and make the wire two thousandths of an inch in diameter, and then control it with a five-axis motion control system underwater, it all works just great. Um, <laughs> And, and those wire EDM machines are fearfully expensive, so it's, it's out of the range of uh, something that uh, a hobbyist would, would like to have. Um, so the, the gratitude is to this company called Almar Tool in, in Washington, uh, who, um, who turned out to be chess head enthusiasts, um, and they were quite happy to help out. They also made uh, custom form tools for my metal lathe to cut the, um, the circular shape in, in the middle. And that's done in a single pass. Um, and so again, the wire EDM cut the uh, high-speed steel uh, uh, cutting tools for that and put in the relief so that the chips clear reasonably well. I have to use a little more coolant than I want to. Um, on those operations. Question. Yeah, just from a machinist perspective, if you're if you're if I had wanted to make that at home, yeah. the only thing I could think of is to, you know, rough cut it and then come in with a file and, and yeah. work extra. You long. can't buy a file that small. I that. They're not made. <laughs> Believe me, there's been a few conversations along those lines. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, but um, uh, the wire, the, so 3D printing obviously is a, a, a good alternative for this, and Jeremy's done uh, a couple of 3D printed prototypes of these, and they really look quite nice. Um, and um, so I, I think as the quality of 3D printing home solutions continues to improve, this is more accessible as a, um, as a project solution. Um, let's go to the next slide, try to remember. Uh, Okay, just this is uh, what it looks like when you're making 10 of these sets at one time, and there's a ridiculous amount of time involved in all of this. Uh, but uh, it's not very often I have that many chess pieces on, a, on, a, on my bench in the shop, so I thought it'd be fun to bring a, to bring a picture of it. Um, next slide. Um, the most terrifying part of this project was not the king, <laughs> it's the board. Um, so what we have here is um, a, a chess board um, that is printed on, uh, on vinyl. And then there's 12 pieces of anodized aluminum squares beveled at 45 degrees that are glued uh, on, onto that. And so you guys should come up here during the break and you can see the chest set unfolded and, and then partially folded here. Um, so the 
with these adhesives these days, you get one shot at positioning this. And so after all the work of making the <coughs> aluminum board pieces um, and getting the board printed, if you screw it up at adhesive time, then you've thrown away a lot of money and time. Um, but this is my setup that I was using when I was using a spray adhesive and uh, rolling it out. I, the, the adhesive I used in the first experiment is headliner adhesive for cars. 177? Uh, it's a Permatex and I don't remember, I think it's 285. Um, very nice stuff, um, uh, but we're, we have on order uh, some 2 mil thick sheet adhesive. Um, and we're going to try that, and I think it's going to be better um, for a, a long-term solution. The, the challenge is that as the, as the playing surface folds, you don't want it to peel apart. And, and so there's a certain amount of terror involved in getting that part to work. Um, so I think next slide. Uh, okay, moving on to the next project. Um, you guys are mostly familiar with a website called Thingiverse. Um, so if you have a 3D printer, this, this is uh, a highly productivity improving site. Uh, you could spend the rest of your life on Thingiverse downloading files and printing them. Um, and I've forgotten the name of the chap that, uh, that posted this project, but this is uh, a thing that he calls a harmonic transformer. And it's a mechanical illustration of the relationship between sine and cosine. And the idea is that you print out a whole mass of these pieces. And in this picture, uh, you can barely make out that there is a, there's a hub in the center of, of the unit circle here. Um, and it's connected to these two scotch yokes. So as you turn this around, these scotch yokes move back and forth, and there's a a cosine scale here and a sine scale here, and uh, it's quite, it's really quite clever, um, and uh, and and uh, ironically, there's a chess set in the background of uh, this guy's picture. I just thought that was kind of poetic. Um, uh, so anyway, I have a little 3D printer, but it's got a limited work volume, and I thought. One afternoon, I developed vision problems and couldn't see working on what I was supposed to be doing. Um, so I went out and made my own version of this. Um, and I'll pass this around. Um, but this was uh, my way of experimenting with what it would look like in materials I'm more comfortable working with. So I will pass this around. And um, this is a one-off prototype with no intentions of, of uh, anything other than generating a conversation here at the conference. I thought it would be fun to share. I can't imagine, um, you know, at least one teacher here in the audience, uh, I can't imagine uh, using this in a, a trade class to illustrate the relationships to students. Um, it's, it's for people with a, a more visual mindset, I think it's a rather clever idea. And uh, Have you tried so I, paper and, and attach a pencil and try to draw a sign curve or something? I've heard people do that. Um, yeah, he, he had a demonstration. Uh, it was made from an old record player, and, a, and there was a, a cart that went across the player with a, a slot in it that uh, engaged a pin in the player. As the player okay. went around, this thing went back. And, Turn a record player into a cosine illustrator. Yeah, kind then of there thing. was a tape that, uh, adding machine tape that moved along and, and it drew a sine wave. And yeah, I think in middle school I remember um, one of my friends at school doing something like that. We had two of them connected together so you could get some of waves and show beats and things like that. Yeah, so there is a, uh, there's another, so if you take that the next step, um, uh, was it? Trying to remember who invented it. There's a, uh, um, a device that adds up uh, cam coefficients. Um, I want to say it's uh, made by was it Faraday? There's there's a har it's called a harmonic analyzer. 
a whole book written about it. And the big mechanical contraption with um, essentially 30 gears, each of which could represent um, a uh, sine function. And, and so there's a spring coming off of, of each uh, uh, lever driven by each adjustable cam. And it adds up the terms uh, that are implicit by your orientation of the, of, of the wheel. Um, I, I will uh, try to find the reference to that um, so you can ask me um, at lunchtime or something and see if I can, I can find what, what that was called. I, I, in retrospect, I wish I'd put a, a reference in the slide set here because there's a spectacular book that's been written about uh, building this harmonic analyzer. I suspect if you Google harmonic analyzer on Amazon, you'll find the book for it right away. Um, an incredibly elegant machine. Um, was one of my father's last suggestions to me before he died was that I should build one of those. And, um, I'm uh, not entirely sure I'm going to keep that promise because the thing's probably going to weigh a quarter ton um, uh, by, the, by the time you have it all together. It might be fun, to, and, and it, the, the one in the book had about 30 terms, I think, and so I think if you did a smaller one, you could get the point across, if you could get something fairly close to a square wave with it. So that's the other mechanical illustration um, that, that might be fun in a classroom. And of course, you guys are all familiar with the tide machines that were made, you know, that's the same idea. Um, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, oh yeah, that's just a picture of it. What, all I want you to capture here is you can see the scales up here. There's a little engraved mark on the slots that shows you where you are on the scale. This is not anywhere near something that could be represented as an actual calculating device. I mean, ideally you'd put a Fahrenheit scale on it and do it right. Um, but uh, I, I just wanted to reproduce the basic mechanical experience just to share with you guys and um, and uh, it was a good good way to kill an afternoon so um, let's go to the next slide you built that one afternoon yeah wow uh, okay so let's let's draw back a century or so um, Johann Kepler was famous for working out uh, with tremendous difficulty what the properties of the uh, orbit of Mars are. And he, he concluded that planets were traveling in elliptical orbits. And that's Kepler's first law. And uh, he also worked out that the um, object in orbit sweeps out equal areas and equal time intervals. And that's Kepler's second law. And um, at, the, at the first known return of Halley's Comet, there was a tremendous amount of public interest in understanding what are comets, where do they come from, how do they behave. And uh, the, the return of Halley's Comet stimulated a bunch of people that made demonstration apparatus uh, to, to carry along uh, a little further. And, uh, and build a mechanical device called a cometarium to, to show this. Um, this is a fairly short-lived phenomenon. I may be the only guy in the last hundred years to make one. No, they're the second guy in a hundred years to make one of these things. Um, there's a chap in Japan that, whose name I don't know, but I've seen some pictures of his work, and he, he has done an incredibly elegant job. Uh, but that's the only other one I know of that's been made in the last at least 100 years. Um, so um, what I'm seeing here in this slide is, is to give credit to uh, de Gaulier who uh, presented the idea of this mechanical illustration as part of a, a, a discussion of the orbit of Mercury, which is, has a, a fairly severe uh, ellipse compared to other orbits in the, in the solar system. Um, Benjamin Martin, who's a very famous scientific instrument maker, um, uh, coined the term cometarium, and I think this was to go along with the, all the excitement about the return of Halley's comet. Next slide. Um, so, 
some of you guys may remember I made a little uh, orrery that was designed by the Scottish astronomer James Ferguson. And uh, Ferguson is truly an astonishing fellow. He, he developed a very, very large array of scientific demonstration apparatus. And uh, among them was a cometarium. And I'm not sure whether his was built, but on the right on this slide you can see a sketch of, of uh, what he came up with. And on the left, there's one of several sort of one-off models. I think this one's in the Science Museum in London. Um, but the, the way this, what this is illustrating, uh, has he got a laser pointer thingy, uh, whatever? No, no. Anybody okay. got a laser pointer? Doesn't matter. Um, what we have up here is, is a linear calendar of months <coughs> in a circle. And here we have the orbit of the planet around the sun. Um, this is a, a uh, eccentricity of about uh, 0.6 or 0.65, I think 0.65. Um, and obviously, for a comet, it's unrealistic because the eccentricity should be much wilder. Uh, uh, but it, Ferguson proposed a drivetrain using elliptical pulleys and drive gears. Thank you very much. Um, and so you have a uh, input crank here, which you turn. And it simultaneously drives the calendar um, in uh, even time intervals. And then it, it also drives the elliptical gears uh, to move the pointer. And so you can see that, that when the object is closest to the sun, you know, the area being swept out is quite wide. Uh, but when you get up to the top, the outer limit of the orbit, uh, the angle is very small, but the distance is long, the areas are the same. So people were fascinated that with even turnings of the crank, they could perceive the calendar going normally and the object moving much faster when it's closer to the sun. And uh, there are, there are a numerous solutions to this that involve uh, elliptical pulleys or gears. Um, all of which have varying degrees of difficulty. Um, I came up with a design that's um, uh, a little simpler, uh, but I cheated. I used CNC uh, to, to help. Um, you can see here in, in, the, in the model on the left, you can see that the inner plate is being held by a bridge. Um, and uh, uh, it's all very awkward and it's bent over the years. You can see it's even been re-soldered. Um, but the input crank is on the left and the calendar is uh, between the, the crank and the sun and then, and then the uh, um, orbit of the comet um, is uh, defined by the separation between the inner plate and the outer plate. And I think this one doesn't even go around all the way. I don't think uh, the, the sweeping uh, arm can uh, go past this bridge. Um, so, after looking at a bunch of designs for this, I, next slide, um, I came up with a highly sophisticated prototype. <laughs> uh, but this was, this is actually iteration four or five. Um, the, the challenge, I, what I wanted to do was drive the orbiting body, the comet or planet, whichever you choose to believe it is. <clears throat> Um, I wanted to, to have it run in a track, and um, there are very serious problems with mechanical interference and friction that happen. Um, as you come around the corner, uh, the, the ball wants to jump out of the track. And so I had to find a, uh, a sweet spot in the depth of the track. Um, and the width of the track that, that would make it fairly reliable. Um, and I was, I was quite delighted. So this, this was the piece that gave me the courage to forge ahead. And, forge. Um, yeah, next slide. Um, so the, 
So there is, um, this is a, a plug for a piece of software, if any of you guys are into uh, uh, making your own uh, gear trains and so on, um, you can get it, I think it's off of, uh, I think it's a Canadian company that makes it, there's a piece of software called Gerotic 2, and it allows you to, to assemble gears, some of which can be elliptical, into a train and, and experiment with them. Um, this software gives you uh, all the critical parameters uh, for each gear, um, including the shape that you can pour into a CAD system. Um, and uh, it gives you some uh, G-code if you want to mill them on CNC routers and so on. Um, incredibly flexible, incredibly inexpensive, and incredibly powerful. Can't say enough good things about that software. If you're a clockmaker, it has <coughs> different striking train options and pendulum options and so on in it. And an incredibly, incredibly sophisticated piece of work. Um, and uh, I was, I was, this project would have been impossible without it, I have to say. Next slide. So, um, so this is what my device ended up looking like. And um, there, there were a couple of problems with this design with respect to cost. Uh, one of them is that uh, the brass top plate necessarily had to be a bit thick. And, uh, um, and still make its way through the uh, etching process for the artwork. Um, uh, but the, the interesting challenge for the point of view of this group uh, was the business of laying out the, the lines that divide the equal time intervals. Um, and, and the question is, you know, where, where are they? <laughs> and how, how do you get there? Um, the, uh, the, the rest of the artwork was really pretty simple. Um, uh, and uh, um, uh, the company that does the etching for this top plate is in, uh, in Tacoma, Washington. They're called Northwest Etch. And they are wonderful people that will work on short run projects for artists and so on, in, in addition to very sophisticated industrial applications of chemical etching. Um, so, you guys are looking for somebody to do that kind of work, drop me a line and I'll pass along the contact information. But I can't say enough good things about that company. They're very, very nice. Uh, this track, uh, that's not just a simple groove. Is that, is that a, a actual machined, uh, I see a shadow up there. Is, is that a complex uh, track? It's, it's just a simple uh, 5 eighths wide track that's okay. about 93 thousandths deep. Um, uh, and so the plate had to be thick, and brass is expensive, and so those plates are $300 a piece. Um, so you don't want to screw up. <laughs> uh, I, I prototyped my, uh, my uh, CNC code in, on aluminum sheets, and uh, I only had to use two to get it right, so I was, I was relieved. But I can tell you that the day that I cut out, I made 10 of these, the day I did that cutting out, I was a nervous wreck by the end of the day. Uh, but they all came out very well, and I was very relieved. Um, so it was it was a uh, quite an undertaking. Um, so back to the question of the uh, area lines. Next slide, please. Um, Favorite slide. This is how it was done. Uh, I leave the rest as a trivial exercise to the user. Next slide, please. No, seriously, um, the, I, I had no idea of how I was going to tackle this. I am, I am not a mathematical genius, although I'll bet half the people in this room could do this as well. Um, but I found this on the web, and uh, I, I just tore out the pieces that I needed and made a little spreadsheet for each arc segment and it worked out it worked out perfectly and then it confirmed mechanically when I put the gears together and ran it and I, I was I was delighted with the result um, I the, the chap that did it uh, published it in uh, 2015 his name is Derek Huggo H-U-G-G -G. I'm trying to read the name H-U-G-G-A-R -G -G um, and uh, to my knowledge, this is the only 
decent explanation of this problem domain on the entire internet. Um, I'm really grateful when I did find it. So I, I want to give credit to the to the guy that put this out. Uh, so next slide. Um, so when you're going to make 10 of these, you tend to accumulate a few parts on the bench. So here's another bench picture. Um, and you can, you can see one of the early prototypes in the background and some old prototype elliptical gears. Um, uh, I should comment, uh, the gears were made on a uh, water jet, uh, a CNC water jet. And uh, um, there's a local uh, company in town that has one of these and they did it for me for next to nothing. I was very, very grateful. They're super nice people. Why are you making 10? Because uh, I didn't have enough money to buy any more plates. <laughs> I mean, people ordering these things? Or yeah. You hope they're going to order these Yeah, things? I've sold a couple of them. Okay. Um, and uh, um, the project was, uh, it was going to happen for at least me, and then one of the customers that bought my orderly heard about it, and he ordered one right away. And then he emailed one of my other customers, and she ordered one, and I think there's a third. Uh, so you've got a few left over. I have a few, yeah. How much? 3,000 quotas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, this is not a sales presentation. <laughs> um, but if, later in person. <laughs> later, in, we can talk about it in the bar. Uh, but uh, it's basically about a thousand bucks or somewhere in there. Um, and and a third of which is the top plate. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to be putting my cat through college. Um, on the right hand corner there? How's that? What's the top plate on the right hand side? Uh, that's a, one of the 50s, I think, uh, or a prime, might be a prime. Yeah. Um, well done. And, uh, so, anyway, uh, somebody also asked what this little sculpture is in the background here, and that's a, uh, a wooden rendition of the, uh, of the uh, specific heat of liquid helium-4 in a temperature range from... Uh, about 0.1 Kelvin to uh, uh, 4.2 degrees Kelvin, and the spike in the middle is the lambda point where where uh, helium four turns into a superfluid. It's 2.172. Huh? Who didn't know that? Oh well, it's, it's it's actually a fairly well known relationship, and I made it for my father for a desk ornament one year for Christmas when I didn't have any other ideas. Uh, uh, next slide. Um, so. Here's a close-up of the commentary. Oh, I should start circulating it yes, around. Yes, you should. Um, sorry. Handle it with care. Yeah, so... Um, uh, there, is, there is a big plate across the bottom of the top plate, which is a thick piece of aluminum. And if you just lift it by that, it's okay. Um, it hopefully will survive. Um, and go ahead and uh, turn it around. I mean, it's here to be used, and and so you should you should have the chance to see what it's to see what it's like. Um, uh, just a commentary on the making of the gears. You can see here on the edges um, of the spokes of the gears that there's a bit of a fuzzy texture to the cut, and and that's really the artifact of the water and garnet going by at about uh, 150,000 PSI, give or take. Well, actually, I think it might have been 175 on this machine. Um, and uh, um, I did hand file some of the burrs off the teeth just to, to fine tune the shape, but um, to me it was interesting to just leave it more in a rough cut form to give future people an idea of how it might have been made. Um, the only commercial gear in this, there's two commercial gears, and that's uh, the, the worm gear and the worm that are that are driven by the crank, and everything else we made. Um, so that was uh, that that was a lot of fun, and it's amazing to me. No matter where I go to different vendors and machine shops and so on, people get interested in this stuff and ask questions, and so it's really. Uh, generates a lot of fun conversations. Question. How, how difficult is it to lay out and design the 
the uh, supports and, and the uh, shaft holes to get everything to align and what happened? Uh, the question was, how do you, how difficult was it to lay out the uh, um, the support bars, you know, to know where to drill the holes to, to make all this go together? Um, the, the credit goes to that gearotic software that I mentioned for gear design. One of the output parameters of that is the pitch distance between two gears. And so no matter what diametral pitch you make and however many teeth you specify the gear to have and so on, it calculates the whole thing for you and lays it out. So it just drops right into your CAD system and you're off and running. Um, so again, uh, I remember what Isaac Newton said. He says, if I see further, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Well, that's how I feel about these projects. The, the technologies that are available are utterly amazing to me. Uh, so uh, let's trundle on to the next slide and see what we come up with. Uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's the, in case I forgot the commentarium, that's the picture I was going to put in to just show you what it looks like. That was my, it finally works, I'm taking a picture of a picture. Uh, I am not an accomplished studio photographer. Uh, let's go to the next. Is that I'm a gold version? Uh, that's an extra cost option. Okay. Uh, we can talk. Uh, it's actually been requested, you're not the first. Um, um, Okay, yeah, that should that should be carbon fiber. Okay, so I'll make sure I get the right side here. Yeah, you're doing fine. Um, okay, so uh, some of you may remember from uh, a couple of years ago, I, I did a, a recreation of the Napier's bones, uh, which are rods for for uh, doing multiplication and division, and extracting square roots and cube roots. And who better than a calculator conference to to introduce that to? Um, uh, about five weeks ago, uh, one of the chaps that bought one of those sets from me emailed me and challenged me to do the Ganel Lucas rulers. And I was aware of, of what they were, um, but I, I, I had no idea that um, I was ever going to actually make them. But um, this chap emailed and said, uh, I'd like four sets, please. <laughs> and, uh, and so what do you do, right? Uh, well, he, go out to the shop and start cutting metal. Uh, but along the way, I wrote a software system that is an object model of how these calculations are done and generates all the um, code for machining and engraving these rods. Um, and uh, there's about a third of a million lines of uh, machine code that get generated to do this. And uh, it, it was quite an effort. Um, and, and so I will, instead of being tardy like I was with the commentarium, I will start this around a little sooner. Uh, but it's, I, I made a little box for it, this is a prototype box. And, uh, um, and in it there are 23 rods. Um, and, and it's just a, a real simple box. And, the division rods are in the front and the multiplication rods are in the back. Um, and I'm going to show you how the uh, multiplication and division work. Um, but this, this box may need to be altered a bit. It's kind of hard to get, get a rod out of it. Um, I'm thinking about putting a ribbon around it like your battery removal ribbons that you're all familiar with. Is that a 12-digit machine? You're in trouble. Okay. Uh, multiplication rod. Here's here's one of them, and they're it's they're about 11 inches long, and they've got um, uh, the decades arranged in a, a order from top to bottom, from sm small to large, and uh, uh, they're made out of the same aluminum as the Napier spoons. Uh, so I'm gonna I'll start this around. Uh, preemptively here. How am I doing for time? Only time. No okay. Hey, Jim. Sir. Is that an etching uh, solution to color it? it? Um, the, uh, what I do is I have a, uh, my, my CNC mill is a, just a 
bog standard Bridgeport class mill. And the spindle only goes to like 5,400 RPM. So um, what I've done is I've made a bracket and I've put a, um, a Hess, uh, sort of like a Dremel spindle on the side of the spindle and it goes at 30,000 RPM. So my, so I'm engraving these 9 thousandths of an inch deep at uh, 30,000 RPM with a feed rate of 25 inches per minute. And uh, then I'm uh, uh, painting them with a couple, three layers of black primer, which is uh, what's called a self-etching primer, which generates a chemical bond to the aluminum, and then uh, polish it off. Um, and uh, SEM, self-etching primer, that stuff is magic. I recommend it to anybody. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, a recap for uh, folks that haven't done anything with Napier's bones in the last couple of days. Um, uh, here's an illustration of multiplying the number 2489 by 7. And what you do is you go from right to left recording the digits. So the rightmost digit is 3, and, and you're, you're adding up the digits in these parallelograms. So here is 6 and 6 are 12, so you carry the 1. You add these guys together and carry and keep, keep working your way from right to left. So, um, so the, this, this came out in, uh, I think around 1640 or thereabouts. And, and I, I think you can fairly say that Napier's Bones was the first calculating aid that went viral worldwide. Um, and it was translated, the booklet for it was translated into many languages. Um, it's, it, the, uh, the calculation technique is descended from an old Arab lattice multiplication technique that was probably been known a couple of thousand years. Um, uh, but um, Napier's uh, had a strong relationship with Pearson, who of course was one of the principal uh, uh, promoters of the early slide rule idea. And uh, Napier died just as his, as his book was published, so he never really got to see it go worldwide. Um, but this was in use uh, really uh, up into the early 19th century. And uh, mechanical calculators hadn't come out yet. Um, so now you come to the year 1885, and uh, um, a railway engineer by the name of Ganil noticed that he was making mistakes with Napier's bones, you know, by blowing the carry. Um, and uh, um, let's hit the next slide. I don't remember what it is, but I'll fake it. Uh, oh, okay. Um, the, the, um, the, the basic genesis of this idea was that uh, two guys that are members of the French Academy uh, got acquainted. Um, Lucas was already uh, teaching in mathematics and he proposed a, a problem at one of these conferences and this railway engineer named Ganil came along and solved it. And the generation of these calculating rulers is actually an artifact of, of, the, uh, of solving whatever this problem was that Lucas proposed. I cannot find anything in the literature to suggest what Lucas's proposition was. Um, it may be out there, I just haven't found it yet. Um, but they published it and, uh, in uh, uh, a little box with wooden rulers and first for multiplication and then, and then for division. Uh, but this didn't last very long because um, as, as, the, uh, uh, as the century was closing out, uh, mechanical calculator devices were starting to become available and affordable. And so these had a fairly short, a, a fairly short lifetime. They didn't get copied a whole lot. Let's have the next slide. How many digits could you deal with there? How many sets do you have? Uh, this is one of the problems with this. Is you, you know, if you use the digit four, you know, you need two four rods, and, and that's why my the guy that challenged me has ordered four sets. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's do a multiplication problem. Um, 
on the left, the, um, I'm, I'm just showing uh, the seven row, and I'm, the rods are two, eight, and six, and so the, um, the job here is to multiply 286 by seven. And what you do is you start at the upper right, and you follow the arrows. So you imagine these big triangles are leading you from right to left. And so you follow the two and you get to the zero. And then this triangle takes you to the next ruler, and that's a zero. And this triangle takes you to the two. Okay, so you're, and over on the right here, I put red lines in to, to show the path. Okay, so what we have not done here is we have not done carry calculations. It's a straight line. And and Gunil's argument was, hey, this is easier and faster. So as fast as you can write down the partial products and add them up, you can do multi-digit multiplication. Um, and uh, um, and they caught on uh, pretty quickly, actually. And they um, within a few years, they'd sold quite a few of these sets. Well, let's have the next slide. So, um, it, this is obvious, right? Um, well, it, it wasn't to me. Um, so, d division is um, d division is an interesting trick. And uh, so you actually go from left to right. So here I have 286 divided by 7. I start here, well, you're already there at 0. But here you go. Um, you just uh, uh, follow the line. So I go 0 to 4 to 0. And then notice that the last column is the remainder column. Um, so there's a remainder ruler for working with the division. So what you have is a result of 0, 4, 0, or 40 with a remainder of, of 6. Um, and again, um, not, not a lot of Pencil work question in the back. How did you know to start with zero? I read the instructions. <laughs> <laughs> no implicit genius implied here. Um, so um, let's go to the next slide. So you can, if you're not satisfied with the remainder and you want decimal results, you take the remainder and uh, divided by 7. And so here you can see a, a 6, which is the remainder, has been set up, and then two digits, so we want two decimal digits, and there's going to be a final remainder. And again, you follow the, follow the yellow brick road, or in this case the red line, and you get 85 with the remainder of 5. So it's 40.85 with um, uh, a, essentially a triple out 5 remainder Here's the trick. It, you're done if you get to zero uh, in the remainder. There's no more. There's no more terms. But if you're, you know, calculating something like twenty-two sevenths, it's going to go on for a while. Um, but um, this is this is another argument for why uh, um, people want multiple sets. By the way, these rulers are made by a company in Florida. Um, on laser engraved wood, and you can you can buy them off Amazon, and uh, um, uh, uh, so I understand that people buy multiple sets, and you, you need the extra digits. What does thermal expansion do on the uh, fourth decimal place? <laughs> in in your case, since you're in quantum lock, yeah, um, <laughs> it, it doesn't matter a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's go to the next slide. Um, yeah, okay, I think that's it. And uh, um, so the, the these are working their way around. Um, folks in the back, I, well, I guess I'm in the back, so I can put it away. Who has more questions? Yeah, those, those beautiful... Uh, Engraved rulings on your uh, on your harmonic multipliers. 
I, I'd like to know how you made those because I'd like to incorporate something something like that into, into my uh, mirror tester. Uh, the way the engraving is done is is with a uh, what's called a drag engraver. It's a diamond tip with a 60 degree cutting angle, and it's in a uh, spring loaded uh, fixture driven by a CNC. Um, and and so to engrave, you index over to where you want the artwork. You drop down until the spring is in pressure. In pressure. Now you just drag it around the metal in whatever direction you want to go and then lift up again when you're done and uh, um, I published a article on how to make one of those drag engravers in uh, Digital Machinist magazine half a dozen years ago uh, and I could send you a PDF you get a hold of me uh, between sessions and, and uh, I can send you the article um, but it's basically a diamond drag engraver and and the expensive bit is the, the the tip, which is you know ten bucks or something, and 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 then the rest is just whatever scrap metal you have lying around in your shop. Um, and so you you do want to hold because you have a plunging part um, that's being held by the the spindle. You want very little wobble. So I tried to keep the wobble down to about a hundred thousandth of an inch between the the center mount that holds the diamond and the, and the spindle itself and it turns out if, if that clearance gets much larger you can you, you can start to see problems in letters that are say 30 thousandths high you know they start to go bad on you so you really have to be careful about that clearance but not, not a big deal if you're um, with a little practice um, other questions okay Richard um. Well, at our conference in Los, La, uh, in, in Corvallis, we some of us went to your shop, yeah, and that was yeah. some years ago. I imagine it's considerably uh, denser now. Um, yeah, there's. Uh, I don't think I put it in here, but I bought a. Uh, the question was, what has been added to the shop since the conference met in my shop um, some years back, and um, just one machine is well couple machines that come in. Um, I'm restoring a uh, World War I vintage shaping machine, which is a, uh, a predecessor of what we now call a vertical mill today. Um, and uh, catch me offline, I've got a picture on my phone I can show you, but I, I didn't. Uh, that's being restored and it's not working yet. Jeff? Well, uh, have you considered Doing blued steel for the uh, air, the hands on your uh, commentarium, as opposed to the black. Oh, the qu the question was, did I consider doing blued steel? Yes, and I chickened out. Oh come on! Out. Yeah, um, I'm not a a uh, clock maker, so there's some there there's some choices I would have uh, uh, done differently. That's the primary one, believe it or not. We'll talk. Yeah, um, but um, yeah, I just cut the I cut the hands out of brass and just hit them with a the primer, and um, it, it worked out. Any other? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.